early the Friday morning, so people are coming in slowly. But I think it's good that you are here, that you took the time to have this class. I think we will start in two minutes from now. So if you want to take a cup of coffee or something, we start in two minutes. Okay, let's start. Um, so last four times you have had a class from René on the term machinery and thermodynamics. So I will take over from now on. And uh, today we will discuss hydraulic term machinery. So the, the class for the next week will look like, so this week we will discuss, today we will discuss hydraulic term machinery. Coming Tuesday, we will discuss the application and pump and compressor curves. Uh, next Friday, we go to gas turbines, and then we have some class number of class on gas turbines. And also two classes will be given by uh, Vera Popovic on uh, uh, materials and mechanicals just before Christmas. So today, the class on hydraulic machines. So last week, you all discussed all kinds of term machinery, but in a broader sense. and uh, Today, the focus will really, really be in hydraulic machines, so with liquid as a working medium. So you have some simplification, you have some complications, but I think it's very relevant for the application of term machinery. So this are we going to discuss today. So these are the four items. Introduction to hydraulic term machinery, the recap of hydraulics, pumps, and hydraulic turbines. So very, I think we also discussed in the first class, it's about the naming of term machinery. So for, for liquids, we always talk about pumps to, to, to increase the, the pressure. And if you want to extract energy from a medium, we use turbines. Um, so if you have any question, please use the chat. I try to, to summarize them to get together. Um, yeah. Okay, let's continue. It's also the first time I will use the iPad to make some uh, elucidation. So it might, I hope it will all work, but we'll see when I use it. Okay, so very important here is actually, I think we also discussed in the first time is what's the definition of term machinery. And the, the, the role of a term machinery is to add or extract energy from an external world to a fluid. So for example, if you have a pump, you want to have energy, in this case, most time pressure or increase in velocity to a, a liquid to pump it from one location to the other location, either because there's a height difference between those locations or you have to, to, to compensate the friction losses. So really that's really the wall of the pump to bring the medium from one location to the other, normally at a at an higher pressure. The other way around, if you have a medium at a high pressure, you can extract energy from it by releasing the pressure by using a turbine. So a pump is really in increasing the, the energy from the medium and the, the, the turbine is the other way around. And we can classify term machinery in a number of ways. So we had about uh, the flow machines. So what is it? hydraulics, thermal, uh, compressible, incom incompressible for normally hydraulics and compressible for, for gas and vapor, which is like discussed power absorbing, producing. Then the flow pad. So the standard one is the axial, radial, and you have all kinds of uh, cross media in between, so cross flow, centripetal. And actually important one is also the, um, um, the other one is really uh, what's the pressure change in the rotor. We discussed this. So in, if you have a fully impulsive rotor, then the pressure change is, uh, is achieved in the stator. And um, so actually in a rotor, you only have a uh, deflection of the velocity. And by a reaction turbine or, or a compressor, you also have an increase in pressure in the rotor. So with an impulsive turbine, you only have an increase in impulse momentum in the router and by reaction turbine you also have a change in pressure in the router and uh, you can show that really on, on the blade shape of the the router and the turbine on the router for an impulsive and a, a reaction turbine well the flow regime 
Well, we saw the French's turbine with a diameter of about 10 meter. He sailed like here. And also we saw the steam turbines where you really do work with castles. And if you look at in a thermodynamic uh, diagram, well, it's an uh, HS diagram. So the H on the, the Y axis and S on the X axis, you really see that in this case, the liquid, the pumps and the tur hydraulic turbines are in this situation. And um, uh, the, the, the steam turbines are always in this situation where we have vapor or gas. And a very different here is different here is in this situation, we have income more or less incompressible flow. So the density is constant. And if you are talking about the gas, especially at high velocity, you can't treat the density to be constant. So you have to use other uh, equations to solve the, solve the issue. But at least these are really other classification, uh, hydraulic and thermal. Today, we really discuss about hydraulics. The coming days, we will discuss more about the thermal, thermal machinery. Uh, all kind of fluids you can have there. So when is this flow to be uncompressible? Well, and here on the top of beta is the, 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 uh, the definition of compressibility. And actually it, it says actually uh, the, the rate of change of the density with the pressure. So uh, if you have an incompressible flow, the difference or the pressure stays constant and also both in, in location and in time. So the, 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 on a, in, in location and in time, you don't have change in, in density. Uh, well, you couldn't work that out. And actually, if you work that out, you see because the pressure, the density stays constant, the only change in thermal energy is related to temperature. So actually pressure and thermal effects are decoupled. And if you have a compressible flow, we shall say that they are very coupled. So the, the, the pressure and thermal effects, but the, the, the big advantage of an, an, an hydraulic machinery with an incompressible flow is that you have a uh, big decoupling. And then can you treat a an, an gas to be incompressible? Well, that's a, typically about something Mach 0.3, something like that. I think it's for all gas with all liquid, all, all kind of fluids, but Mach, Mach 0.3. So normally in, in, in liquid pumps, you normally really can treat it to be uh, uh, incompressible. If you look at uh, compressors, for example, used in, 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 in gas turbines, your Mach is about 0.8 in certain situations. So you really should treat it as compressible. That's important uh, uh, for, 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 for those kind of compressors. But today we talk about hydraulic machinery and we're here on the left side of this page, so we can treat them as incompressible. Hydraulics. So that's actually what I talk about. So we, if you have the, the, the standard flow, so a constant uh, density and also steady state. Well, the first of all is, of course, conservation of mass. Uh, and because rho is constant, is Q is uh, velocity times area, area is constant. So that's the easy one to hear, rho is constant, so the Q is also constant. Then we can derive actually uh, the energy conservation and also the, the uh, Bernoulli equation. Well, you can uh, write them in three different ways. Uh, so that the, the lowest one is really, if you call it in, in pressure terms. So this is, for example, if you derive it directly um, from the um, from, from Navier-Stokes equation, you end up with, with this equation. And actually, in our cases, especially if you talk about pump and uh, hydraulic turbine binds, um, most people calculate in height, so height, height, uh, in meters. So finally, actually, they're all the same constant because actually the, the difference is the rho and the g. So if you either divided by rho g or not, so that's really the main difference. What do you do with the rho g? But uh, because the rho is constant, you have an incompressible one, and G is constant this week because we stay on Earth normally, then you can treat these, all these equations are more, are, are actually the same. It's actually, you should pick the most best to do there. So what we see in this equation, you have the pressure energy, you have the kinetic energy and the um, um, potential energy. So these are the, the best state here. So it's the pressure energy, the kinetic energy, and, and the height. So these are the three main components of these things and they stay constant if you follow the streamline of such a fluid. So in this case, you can calculate quite a lot with these numbers you have here. And if you do it for a pump and uh, a turbine, 
So actually the pump adds energy from the outside world to the media. So it adds on the left side and a turbine and the and losses, potential losses, extract energy from uh, such a system. So we call it normally, if you call the, what was what was added of the energy by the pump. So we do it now like you see in uh, the, 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 the dimension of, of meters. You have the head of the pump is normally in meters. Turbine heads also normal meters and you also have the, the hydraulic losses. You also calculate them in, his, in, in, in meters. And actually, if you look like, uh, how can you calculate hydraulic losses? They normally uh, uh, go with the square of velocity, especially if a turbulent flow, we really show with the square of velocities. So you have the, the square of the velocity, uh, where you have the conversion with 2G, and then you can calculate that. So the friction, for example, your friction in a pipe, you can have the friction factor times the L over D, and then you can calculate, for example, uh, the losses in a pipe. So if you remember correctly from, from fluid mechanics, we have a kind of this Moody diagram where for different Reynolds numbers, you can have the, the friction factor, different uh, pipes are plotted here. So a smooth pipe and is actually increasing in, in the roughness in the pipe. So you see if you have increasing roughness in the pipe, you also see you have an increase in the friction factor. Uh, if you see an increase in the Reynolds number, you see a decrease of friction factor. An example, this for example, the laminar flow, you see there in general, you have a higher friction factor because viscosity is important there uh, than in a turbulent flow. So actually, if you really want to have low friction factors, you should have a high Reynolds number and a smooth pipe. And these are typical numbers for, uh, for, for friction factors. Well, you have some typical friction factors uh, you want to do with that. Those are roughness for surface you can do there. So if you have these numbers above that, you can relate them to the relative roughness of different um, materials, and then you can calculate the friction factors for such a pipe, and by combining them all together, you can get the overall friction factor. From all the things, we have the, the losses. So you have the friction factor and the losses. Um, if you all have to, that them together, so actually it also squares uh, with the velocity squared, also, also scales with the velocity squared. Uh, the losses in, 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 in elbows and fells and things like that. Uh, and these are typical numbers. Uh, I think these are from, from, from wide fluid mechanics. We can find them everywhere on the world. And actually what really happens in a lot of things of designing such piping system, uh, you make kind of, uh, an, an, they, they, you make kind of a system of all the, the, these losses and then you can calculate the, the, the pressure drop. And that way you can uh, calculate the head that's required by, for example, a pump. Uh, to pump the fluid to set the system. So this way you can calculate that. Uh, then we go back. It's a little bit different. So it's really about hydraulics still now. And now uh, this is really also discussed during the last classes is really the Euler equation. And that's an important one. So actually uh, the Euler equation uh, tells uh, the relation between the change in mom angular momentum in a rotor, so for example, v theta one is at the in v theta one is at the outlet, v theta two is at the inlet. Um, the change of angular momentum, and that's the transfer of energy from uh, the, the rotor to the fluid. So you can calculate if you have this uh, the change of angular uh, sorry the change of angular momentum is really related to the mass flow mm -hmm. times the change in in, in uh, this uh, momentum. Uh, well, you can calculate the power of such a thing is, is, is the, 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 the torque times the, the angular velocity. Well, you can work that out. So actually, if you do it like that, so the, uh, the, the mass flow, I will just take a picture. Uh, I will share my whiteboard. Okay, so if we have, um, on our case, we have the, um, 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 so we have the, um, um, oh yeah, we have the, the order equation. So we have um, um, P is, E is the, the, the torque 
times the angular velocity. And uh, we have the angular velocity, uh, well, sorry, sorry, there is, uh, is uh, the angular velocity times the mass flow times the change in angular momentum. Two. Uh, and omega care R1 is U1 and omega R2 is U2, where if you look like a pub, so the U2 is the rotational speed of the rotor at the outside, U1 at the inside, and V theta 2 is the, red, uh, is the absolute velocity at the outside and at the inside, V theta 1. So if you work this out for a pump, I'll make back to this one. So if you work this back to the pump, you see that V theta one, uh, the, the head of a pump can we really calculate it as V theta one uh, and U one and V theta two U two. And I think this is quite an important result because also in this way you can also already calculate uh, the simple curve, uh, the, 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 um, the, the pump performance curve. So I really want to do that right now. So we have the pump head is uh, phi theta one u one minus phi theta two u two divided by g. Sorry, we cannot uh, we cannot see the. No, I will share now to my my iPad. Sorry about that. Sorry. All right. Sorry. I have to get a little bit handy with it, but Okay, so this is the same one we have here. So that the pump is V theta one, V theta two, uh, U two. So if we work this out, so if you have a pump that rotates with the angle of velocity and the uh, U two, uh, well, we actually this little bit wrongly. So we call this the outside because actually it should be all the way around. Should be theta two, theta two. Theta one, theta one, we derive from each other. So if you have an angular velocity, it's an U2 is R2 omega, R2. This is U1, is this your situation? U1, oh sorry, this is about this, R2 to the center, of course. This is R1 to this one, so R2 is to the outside. Then you have the flow velocity here. So here you get the flow following this section. So this is then, uh, if you remember right from uh, uh, the last classes, you have the absolute velocity is the relative velocity uh, plus uh, the speed. And if we do it like this, um, so this, um, sorry, this uh, maybe do it on. We call this phi. They better better do this phi because otherwise we mix up the w and the omega. Like this, so that's relative and the rotational. So if you look at this section, for example, where the flow exit um, the turbine, you have the u two in this direction. You have uh, phi relative in this direction. And you have, uh, so, for, for, so you get here, if you derive it from this side, you get the flow coming out of here. You have an, 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 a part that is perpendicular to the, to the, to the exit, that's Vx and V theta. So we have the U like this direction. And you see that uh, V theta, is Vx divided by uh, tangent alpha already. Uh, so you have Vx 
the phi theta. And this is phi, the exit of the router. This is alpha. Um, it's, so it's not, um, if you define alpha like this, it's phi theta is, sorry about that. I made a mistake here. This phi x times times alpha. Well, if you assume that the flow enters fully radial into the router, then phi theta, uh, uh, theta one is there zero. That is zero. Then uh, if we, um, yeah. sorry about the confusion. I make a lot of confusion about using the, the same symbols. <laughs> so phi theta is really the absolute velocity and here we talk about the relative velocity. So if you look here at what's the relative velocity, the tangential relative velocity at the exit of the rotor, that is u minus uh, phi relative theta. You see u is in this direction, phi relative theta is in that direction. So that's the phi theta two is that. That is the relative direction, this is the absolute one. So if we, so if you look at H pump, like we said, is H pump is U to phi theta two absolute minus U one phi theta one absolute divided by G. Well, if you assume that phi theta one is zero, so it's fully radial in trends. So this is then zero. So H pump is U2 times U2 minus free relative theta, like so divided by G. H pump is therefore U2 squared divided by G minus uh, U2 divided by G. And we have here relative is phi x uh, tangens alpha, which is a relative again. And what you really see here, so that's h pump is u to square divided by g minus u to divided by g phi x relative tangens alpha. And you see that phi x relative that is a Q divided by A. So that's your volume flow divided by A. Because that's the velocity that's coming out of your system. So H pump, and that's really where I really want to have U to square minus U to G Q divided by A uh, times alpha. And that's important. So if you look at like this, so this is really what I want to enter because this is an important graph you're going to use for the coming days. And these are pump or compressor curves. And what normally plotted here is on the X axis, the Q. So the volume flow or the mass flow or something, but for pumps, we can, we can really, really work with the volume flow. On the Y axis is called the head. And really, if you look at this equation, so if the Q is zero, the theoretical head is u2 squared divided by g. And then you see a linear decrease of the flow, of the, the, the headline. So if you have a constant, if you have a flow, if you have a pump with a constant uh, rotational speed, you see that the theoretical pump curve is a straight line that decreases depending on the, the u2. So that the, the higher the u2, so the higher the rotational speed or the, it gets higher here. And uh, it, it's also the, it also determines the, this steepness of the line. So this is an important part. This is really a theoretical pump curve. At the pump one is Vx and not sigmoid. 
I can't extend this bless you. Well, I, I don't I see a message in the chat, but I don't uh, maybe can clarify your, your question. So maybe you can ask that. But um, so so what really the message is is really that you get this theoretical pump curve. In reality, you got losses. So normally, this is normally a point where you have the best operating point. They call it BEP. And what you will see with increasing Q, you get increasing uh, velocity. Um, uh, once you get increased velocity, so you get here. So this theoretical curve and in reality a curve, really because you get here more losses, it goes like this. So because of the increasing and the increase with the, uh, with the square of the velocity, you get more losses like this. And on this side, because then you are below uh, the optimum situation, you get all kinds of friction loss and, and the, the flow doesn't follow the, the, uh, the blades anymore. You get it goes something like this. And normally there's a minimum flow, Q min, and be the loaded flow, you get only eddies and all kinds of stuff within a, in a pump. So this is important. A typical shape of the pump curve is really uh, this one, the blue one here. So this is really typical shape, just a real shape. And the black one is really the theoretical shape. We would use this pump curve normally. So with an increasing uh, falling flow, you get a decreasing head. So it's actually the, the, the uh, if you put such a, a pump in a system, it can deliver, if you, for example, have a flow of this one, you can pump up the water to a head like this. If you have a smaller flow, you can pump up the water like this. So head is really defined as the level of uh, the height you can pump uh, the water to with a pump. It's a simple definition of a head. Okay, that's really the basics of a pump curve. So if we look like pumps, so like we said, we transfer energy to the fluid and it's really circuit fluid or gathered pressure wise. So uh, all kinds of pumps uh, are here. All kinds of pumps are here. So really you see that this rotation speed with, uh, with the blades that accelerate the flow like this is cut, discussed and they transfer the, the, the energy to, to, to the system. Very important here is actually, so you get a high speed at the exit of these uh, blades and it's converted into pressure by this volute. So in the volute, you really see there's an increasing area in the fluid volute to really to, to, to convert the kinetic energy into, uh, from, the, from, from the acceleration of the fluid into pressure. So here we get a better picture. Here it enters the suction eye, the blades, backward bound, uh, uh, fold the blades. And then you really see it will leave like this. The flow will go and follow like this. And here it recovers the pressure. So this is a typical, really typical state of a radio pump. They're almost sort of similar like this. And then there's something because you get normally higher pressure here than here, because it has the low velocity here. They, they, they want this section to be as small as possible because you get losses here again. So they get backflow here. So there's really design of pumps also laid to get this as small as possible to get a good, good volume in kind of with a good rotor design. This was a radio pump, an axial pump is actually, uh, well, also this, there were actual uh, turbine, but it, uh, actual compressors, but it really is more where you accelerate the flow and get a small pressure increase by this kind of blades. Well, we have the pump curve. We just had the theoretical pump curve. So uh, this one is the head. So this is typically, if you buy a pump from a supplier, you typically get a, a curve like this. This is a real optimum one, but you get here the Q, the falling flow on the y X axis and the head or other parameters on the Y axis. So this one is the head capacity. It's really like it just derived. This will be here, it is quite a nice one. In reality, it look a little bit less uh, uh, like this. Well, if you multiply uh, the head is actually the pressure increase times uh, the volume, you get uh, the power. So you get also the, the and, 
you can get, get the power and the efficiency. And if you, de if you divide that again by, by um, uh, yeah, okay, so this, so this, this is the horsepower required for the pump. And this is the lowest, lowest one is normally where you have the best efficiency point. So this is really actually, if you want to design a pump, you can define the efficiency as the uh, head delivered, uh, divided by the power required. You have the best efficiency point. And that's really the point we decide where the pump is designed for. And we already saw that uh, below and above that pump, you get, uh, uh, you get um, all kinds of, uh, of losses. And uh, here you have the highest efficiency. Here's a pump des designed for. And uh, so here, if you want to choose a pump, you really should look for a location at this size. And this is important here. So we just had the pump curve. And if you really want to enter to a system, that's important. How are you going to operate? So you have normally have a pump curve and a system curve. So I want to. Uh, So we just had the pump curve here the Q. So it do something like this normally spoken. And if you have a system, so if you have, if you have a pump and there is a, a, a pipe and there can be a valve in the pipe, something like this. And you also want to do a certain height. So you have the suction line here. You put it to a volume at a certain height. So you have the uh, delta H, you have the height difference, and you could also, so actually, so the head is the delta H plus friction losses. Well, we saw that the friction losses, friction losses, they go with the square of the velocity. So if you put such a, a, a figure in the kind of, the, of, of uh, if you put this, so that you have, this is the pump curve, and you have to match that with the system curve. So first of all, you have first have to have the head because you have want to put uh, the water to another level. So this is really delta H you get for the uh, for the head for for the, the the level difference, and then the the losses all increase uh, with the square velocity. So then you get a quadratic line going something like this. And if you put this pump into this system, it will operate here. So then you get here Q and H total, where this one is the friction, and this one is the head, the, the level difference or, the, or the, the, the height difference. So really always, you if you really want to match a system to a pump, you have to have the pump curve and you have to derive uh, the, 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 uh, the, the system curve and the system curve is normally a function of the delta H and the Q and actually Q squared. And this way you can really see where will the pump operate uh, when you're running with such a system. So this is a separate, separate operation point. And if you really see here, for example, this one is the static uh, difference. And this side here between here is really caused by the, uh, um, is really caused by the, um, uh, the friction. I see a question. How is head? Head is not dimensionless. The question is head dimensionless? No, head like the, actually that's are the, uh, equations I saw in the beginning, the head is just really normally defined uh, for a pump. So if you go a little bit back here, you can have different equations. And uh, so normally for pumps, they use the, the above equation because on actually everything is expressed in meter. We can also express it in joule per kilogram. You can also express it in Pascal. So you can uh, express them into each other, these equations. But normally for a pump, you normally go like this. And if you want to have the power, you have to multiply this or actually this one uh, with uh, the, 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 the um, volume flow. 
So head is not dimensionless, head is a meter. But I mean in the efficiency calculation, but then actually then you have to do it with the Q again. So we have the efficiency calculation, we didn't have that here. We come back to the efficiency later. Let's go back to the efficiency later, yeah. So actually, so you have this uh, this all kind of uh, pumps. So it's okay if you really want to have, and this is what I have, you have to do if you have a system, so you know your system. For example, you have the piping system or you have to bring a water to a certain height. With this kind of uh, graph, you can decide what kind of pump do I have to choose. These are all the curves, familiar, familiar of curves for all the kind of pumps. This is how you can, can select the right pump uh, for your application. So we have the total efficiency and actually you have the loss as well. You have the volumetric losses, the hydraulic losses and, and the mechanical losses. So the mechanical losses really, for example, the shaft driving the pump, hydraulic losses are really the losses due to, um, uh, well, uh, due to friction mainly and the, the, the volumetric losses, for example, due to uh, leakage. Very important in a pump and also in a turbine is really uh, cavitation. So actually uh, cavitation is uh, when the water is close to its boiling point. Actually there's a one-to-one rela -one relation between the, the local pressure and, and the boiling point. And actually if you have in a pump, you will accelerate the flow. So within the pump, and that's important to know, is because of flow acceleration, like we saw for the Bernoulli equation, because you accelerate the flow locally, you get a local lower pressure because the pressure stays long, constant amongst those three lines. So if you get a locally lower pressure, the pressure can become that low that you come below low the vapor pressure. And in that case, the water starts yeah, to boil. Actually, part of the water starts to boil. And if you water, water starts to boil, you really get small bubbles and they can implode again when, when they are released again, when they are in a higher pressure ratio. And if you have that uh, bubble formation and uh, implosion again, you can have severe damage to uh, such a system. For example, if you look like this one, this is a propeller for a, a boat. And you really see that uh, the lowest pressure is at the end of these blades. And there you also see that there are see the small bubbles and the bubbles are actually, yeah, the pressure is there so low that locally the water is there boiling. And therefore you get these bubbles and they follow the streamlines, of course. But if these bubbles are close to the surface of, uh, of the propeller, they can implode again and leading to local damage. So it could really look something like here. And it can, if it took a long time, it can really damage your equipment. And therefore you should always uh, avoid cavitation in a pump uh, as much as possible. If it's possible, it's really hard to have minimized the cavitation. And we call that if you uh, actually therefore the, the inlet pump of the of the uh, the inlet pressure of a pump should have a minimum fellow value so that if you have the, the the minimum inlet pressure value of the head we call it in head but if you do the pressure it's the same magnitude but if you have an inlet minimum inlet head you do, uh, can avoid uh, the, 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 uh, that the pressure locally in the pump becomes below the vapor pressure leading to cavitation. And actually that is really called what they called in the literature, the net positive suction head. So the net positive suction head is really the uh, required minimum inlet pressure for the pump to avoid cavitation. So normally in your case, we have the net positivity, positivity hand required. So actually that's really defined by the design of the pump, the acceleration in the pump and the local uh, uh, form shape calculation in the pump. So really, if you really have a, a pump curve from a supplier, you really have there a net positive suction head required. So what's the minimum required input head? And it's also, you can imagine it's a function of, of the, the Q. So the higher the Q, the higher the velocity in the pump. So the more, head is required to prevent uh, boiling. So if you really have uh, the head, the net positive suction head is really designed by the pump design and the available, uh, sorry, 
the available uh, NPSA, so the net positive system had available, that's actually the difference between the height and the losses within the system. So this is a really important one system. And also, if for example, uh, this water is close to 100 Celsius, you can imagine that uh, the vapor pressure is, 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 is almost zero. So then you need a higher uh, net positive suction head to prevent cavitation in the pump than if this water would be 20 degrees. So it's also the state of the water, how far away is it from, 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 from boiling together with uh, this head and the losses of course, uh, that really can lead to cavitation in the pump. So normally in such a situation, we'll also discuss it uh, next Tuesday, we will make a calculation of the situation, but normally the pressure is defined here. So you have a pressure here, for example, one atmosphere, and then you have a kind of uh, height here and losses here, and that really gives the net positive suction head at the inlet of the pump. And you see, for example, if you have the net positive suction head uh, for a pump, you will also see it if you have, if you buy a pump, a good pump, you will have a figure like this. So that's the really minimum required net positive suction head for this pump, and it increases uh, with uh, the, the, the Q because the frost increases. Yeah, the net positive, so the question is the net positive suction head dependent on the system with the pump will use? Yes, of course, that, that's true because like I said on this one, it depends on the losses. So if you have a very high losses in this pipeline and the pressure is defined here, you get a low pressure or low head at the inlet of the pump. So you will probably have cavitation here. So that the uh, net positive suction net available is really uh, uh, depending on the system. Yeah. And required is really depending on the uh, design of the pump. That's the question. Then something about um, uh, uh, di di dimensional diameters and speeds. So uh, if you ever get the flow parameter, you can then uh, define a flow parameter, you can define a head parameter. And um, there's an old question. Okay, there's a one, last one about net positive suction head and, uh, and Q. So for example, this one, if you have the net positive suction head required, if you have a higher Q, if you have a higher volume velocity, you also will get higher local velocities within the pump. And like I said before, if you have lower, higher velocities, uh, you will have, for the Bernoulli equation, you will have local, uh, locally lower static pressure. So therefore, you need a higher inlet pressure or a higher inlet head to prevent cavitation. So this is for the available one here. For net positive so if you have available required or the net positive so you required, you need a higher inlet head at higher volume velocities, at higher volume velocities because of Bernoulli equation. And if you look, for example, what the, the, the available one, so you need higher, but in a system, if you have higher flow losses to the system, you will normally have higher losses. So if you have a higher velocity, so higher Q through the system you normally have a, a lower available because you have higher losses. We discussed that also next Tuesday with an example. Okay, let's go to the dimensionless parameters. So we can define a parameter for the flow, the head and the power. So those are the three most important parameters for a pump. So for the flow, actually um, we can dimension this parameter, so it's a Q. And what you see here is um, you can make the dimensionless. So omega to get a diameter is a kind of velocity uh, measure of the pump. And d square is the area. So this one is dimensionless parameter for the flow parameter. So it's volume flow divided by velocity times area. The head, like we have the, the g, and then you have the dynamic head. So the, the, the v squared. So this is also the, uh, the dimensionless head parameter. And in this way, you can also uh, derive a dimensionless power parameter is power times pressure times volume flow. So the pressure times the volume flow uh, we have here, omega d square, and uh, the pressure is omega, omega rho omega square d square. So you get omega to the power three and d to the power five. 
So these are really typically, you can from dimensions analysis, you can derive these three parameters and you can also express them in each other. So that's important. Uh, and then you want to go to dimensionless diameter and speed. So if you go to dimensionless, um, if you go to dimensionless um, speed, well, we have this one for on the previous plates, you can have some uh, manipulation. If you do then do the power like this, you work it out. You can define a dimensionless speed. So where you actually remove the diameter from this equation, that's a trick you do. You remove the diameter equation and that's why you make them to this power. You can work it out yourself. And then you get this uh, uh, dimension speed equation for, for a pump. So that's the, 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 uh, this, this, the dimensionless angle. Well, I do the an angle of velocity, you can also do the speed, uh, but that's the Q to the power of half and the, 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 this one. So this is some squares to the, uh, to the power of the, 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 to, to the head and the volume flow. You can also relate that to the to, to power equation from the last equation, you come to this equation and you also have the important, and we're going to discuss that if you really want from uh, the, the formulas on the previous equations, want to, be, to remove uh, the angular velocity from that, you can the dimensionless uh, per, uh, diameter and this scales with that. So actually the dimensionless diameter is the real diameter times the, the head to the power one fourth and the volume flow divided by the volume flow to the power one half. And actually this dimension this diameter is can be used in the design of a pump and also what kind of pump should you apply for your different systems. So for example, um, you have this pen dimensionless parameter, we also have dimensionless speed and you can go like that. And then if you really look at different dimensional analysis, so for instance, this for example, for the dimensionless speed, uh, you can have a uh, different type of pump. So the higher the dimensionless speed in these cases, the older uh, the, uh, um, the, older the, uh, the, the, the better design of the pump. There are all kinds of books and handbooks and textbook. So depending on your dimensionless speed and your dimension diameter, you can pick the best pump of, uh, applicable for that applica application. So therefore it's very useful to calculate if you have, well, if you have uh, the flow, and the height you have, you can calculate the dimensions diameter and dimension speed and that way calculate uh, the best pump uh, uh, ready for your application, best applicable for your applications. Okay, I want to give here a short break of about five to now 10 minutes and then we continue with hydraulic turbines. Yeah, there are no other questions out there. So I will now give a break for, for 10 minutes and then we will continue about hydraulic turbines. Now I'd like to restart again. So in the first well, 45 minutes, we talked about pumps and general hydraulic turbine machinery. And now I really want to talk about hydraulic turbines and also about uh, an application. We will do an, an example for that for an, an, a Pelton turbine. Sorry about my handwriting. My handwriting is not that clear as Rene did last week, but I will do my best the second hour to do a little bit more better clear handwriting. Uh, let's see a question. We were not finished at the previous lecture on radium losses inside machine. Uh, yeah, this lecture won't be finished by Professor and becomes all cells to Yeah, that's true. So I want to discuss that. So if there are so very relevant questions about that, please contact uh, René. Uh, we do it like that. So it, it is like that. Um, actually, <laughs> to, to be honest, we see that it's uh, taking more time to do online classes than really uh, real life classes. So therefore, uh, yeah, it's more difficult to do to discuss all stuff within the online classes. So we, we try to focus on the most important one, uh, but that's, that's, that's an advantage of online classes. Okay, now we continue with um, um, hydraulic, tur hydraulic turbines, unless there are some other questions. No, then we go with hydraulic turbines. Yeah, for example, this the, the, the situation in Melland, I think from 2015 or something, about 50% of the power generated by gas, 25% by gold, and the other 25% by a summation of all kinds of other things, but actually no hydraulics. If you look to the world, 
about well one 20 percent about one fifth of the world more than of the uh, world uh, world power production is generated by hydraulics so it's larger than the part uh, generated by nuclear um, so it's a really very relevant part in the world of, of, of power generation actually the first power plants around the 1990s and 1900s for example 1900s they were all hydraulic power plants and, and then the gas and the coal and everything came in but really it's important and at the moment i think well now maybe it's a little bit less but i think hydraulic is really the main main computer to main contrib contributor to a, a renewable energy in the world and the big advantage of hydraulic renewable energy is that you can control it because you have a storage and you can control it and that's the disadvantage of wind and solar you can't control uh, the wind and the solar generation well, these are some uh, typical hydraulic plants and yeah there you are probably you have seen them or you you've been there they're all if they've been quite big so they're normally they, they're related to a lake and uh they did they they, uh, they get the power from the high difference between the the, the lake and the, the downstream world i'll discuss last week so the three quarts in china is 22 gigawatt so that's actually uh two times as big as the uh, total power consumption in the netherlands well, there's some uh, in South America, 14 gigawatts, China, all the 14 gigawatts, Venezuela, 10 gigawatts. So there are really very big power plants, hydraulic power plants in the world where you have a high, a lot of water, a lot of high height difference. We see is all types of the, the turbines. We come back to it later. This all French turbines. We come back to it later what different turbines you have for these uh, kind of hydraulic situations and there's also linked uh, with the dimensionless diameter we just discussed yeah, these are those typically french turbine you see here and the kind of mixed flow turbine you see here so radial in radial out or partial radial out depends a little bit on the design you have the amount of flow and the height you have so this is typically how such a system would look like so you have the reservoir you have the, the, the tubing to the to the turbine, you have the turbine, and they have the downstream runner. I have one question, so maybe we can answer that question in the, the chat. Um, why is the turbine located at the downstream location? It's now here at the downstream location, at the lower end of the system, and not on the upper end of the system. Why is it located at the lower end of the system? You can answer this question in the chat. I think if somebody knows why such a turbine is located at the lower end of the system. Because the power of the turbine is the same. This is the delta Z is the height difference between the lower reservoir and the higher reservoir. But why is it located here on this location at the down end and not on the upper end? The potential energy difference yeah that's not i think there's the ones is prevent capitation so that's the real good answer from toma Budanko. what actually because in this case if you look at on this side on the lower end of the system you have sort of mpsh uh, mpsh that's true so if you put it on the lower end of the system you have more net positive section available the net positive section required by the turbine stays the same but you also have this head here. And if you put, will put it more upstream, you will have a lower net positive suction head available and therefore a high range of chance on cavitation. Well, turbine is the same losses, volumetric loss, hydraulic loss, mechanical loss, we, we just saw this, so we can discuss it the same. And actually the other thing is actually next to the high difference, you also the other thing you have to take care of. Uh, the other thing you have to take care of is really the losses. So really we we saw like this square with the with this scale with the square of velocity with the square of the volume flow. So we see so the delta so the real the head or that's can convert it into power is the, the the head between this one and this one. So the the high difference between this minus the losses and you see the losses scale with the square of the velocity so the higher the velocity the higher the losses and the lower the power generated by the turbine 
that the power generated, the head is converted. The power is high because the power is, of course, head times the volume flow. Here again, so you can see it here. So if you have the volume flow on the x axis again and the head on the y axis again, you see here that uh, you run on the lower head because you get higher losses in the system. So that's important here. Of course, uh, the total power generated is higher here because if you have the total power, you should multiply the head uh, times the, uh, uh, the the volume flow. So the total power uh, will go something like this in this direction. So that's better to know. So if you want more power, you can go more to higher volume flow. If you want a higher efficiency, you want to have losses, you can go more left here, depending of course on the efficiency of the turbine. But it's a simple picture for the system losses. If you really want to do system losses, you should have a low, you should have a low flow. Yeah, and then we see actually there are three types of main turbines. And we go to back them very uh, uh, briefly. So we have the Pelton turbine. And actually the Pelton turbine is, um, the turbine is a fully impulse turbine. So what you see here is that in a Pelton turbine, you have a nozzle where the head is converted into velocity into a nozzle, in a nozzle. And that actually get a very high jet of water out of the nozzle. And that water jet just sprays into these buckets. They really call buckets. And, it by, and because of the buckets, the, the direction of the jet is converted and thereby the kinetic energy from the jet is converted into a rotational energy for this wheel. So this is really a Pelton wheel where you have a full, uh, actually there's a full impulse turbine where the conversion from power into impulse happens in the nozzle and actually uh, uh, within the, the wheel, only that kinetic energy from the jet is converted in kinetic energy for the wheel. And then you have the, the, the Kaplan, that's a fully axial turbine, so it's like here. And therefore you have over, it's a kind of a reaction turbine, We're also part of the, um, of the pressure difference is converted into power into the system. And then you have the uh, French's turbine is a uh, radial flow turbine. We saw that the big ones are, are the French turbine and it really depends on the dimensionless speed and dimension diameter, what kind of turbine you use. So we have the dimensionless speed. Yeah, and I think that's also important. Um, you really should look at what kind of dimensionless speed you use. So that's an important to discuss here. So if you have those, the the Kaplan, the Francis, and the Pelton. So we go to back one. Uh, this is the Kaplan, is the axial. The Pelton is the impulse one, and the Francis is the radial one. So if you look like the Pelton, you really need a very high head because in that head is converted into velocity, and you have an, uh, a low specific speed. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, the other one, the Kaplan and the Francis, they have another range. So really, if you look like, for example, you're in the mountains or you have a, a river run, you really use a different uh, kind of flow. So for example, if, if you have a, a river run, you normally use a Kaplan turbine because you have very small head there. If you have a very high, high difference, you normally use the belt turbine. And the French is, in most cases, you're in between. So for example, the, the, the three quarters, then all these things, they use a French turbine because there's in between. Okay, wait a minute, are there questions? No, sorry. Okay, um, so these are the three types of turbine used for different applications. And you can make them also in, 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 a, in a picture like this. So you have the Q, the velocity, and you have the, the head. So you have a, if you have your low Q, you normally use a, a, a Pelter turbine and you can also optimize for the number of jet. Then you get here the French's turbine. And you get also here the couple of turbines. So it's really actually more okay how it goes from French to back up. And it's also the size. And well, this is a kind of selection diagram for a different type of, uh, of, of turbines. And of course, they, they, they are the optimum design. And uh, they are from overlapping between the section, depending on, on where you want to run. And really, if you want to have the, the, 
uh, the very low head for a river run, you normally have a kind of axial turbine with a high flow. That's also why you don't have axial axial turbine uh, with a low uh, with a low head. Delta, Francis, and Kaplan. So the Kaplan is the actual one. Uh, so it's low difference, high flow rate, and uh, they're quite high visited. And they, they have some risk on, 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 uh, on the cavitation. So here is a typical one. We have the inlet, the guide vent, and the outlet, typically how it looks like. And yeah, well, you can see the size, how big they are. They're incredible big. And that's the most thing for the dielectric turbine in general. They're very big, those hydraulic turbines. That shows all the flat velocity triangles. And then you can see with uh, the, um, um, so you normally have a stator to the red, to get the right inlet conditions for the rotor. And then you can have with the, the oil equation, you can have to calculate the head of the turbine, uh, like normal to oil equations. And there you can calculate the, the, the power generated by the turbine. A Francis is a reaction turbine, so actually also most of the uh, 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 pressure is converted into power into the, the, the wheel. So it's an, uh, it's, normally it's a radial inflow, axial outflow, it's kind of mixed flow burn, mixed flow, uh, mixed flow uh, rotor. It's in between medium to high, to, to large volumetric rates, high efficiency, and of course there's also cavitation possible because also in such a rotor the flow is accelerated. So you have also kind of guide fades. Uh, there they sort of let in, you have the guide fades and they are uh, uh, radial and axial out turbine. They have a little bit complex uh, velocity triangles uh, because you get a radial in and axial outflow turbine. Uh, we've not discussed them into detail here, but you can actually still apply the, the oil equation to the same uh, turbine. It's possible to change the question here, possible to change the pitch of the Kaplan turbine. Yeah, in certain situations, uh, they can, for example, depending on the flow, they can change the, the angle of the stator. Normally you don't, in some cases, you can also change the pitch of the rotor. That's also, but the more advanced, it's also possible. Yeah, it can both be the stator and the rotor pitch can be changed in, an, uh, in a Kaplan turbine. But it's more expensive, but I think uh, there may you increase your operational range and the high efficiency operational range. It's possible, yeah. So you can, the question is, can it's possible to change the pitch of a Kaplan turbine? Yes, that's possible. I don't think it's, uh, this potential can also be probably, you see it here a little bit that it can be changed, but normally you can change it, yeah. Yeah, to increase the, the, the operational range. And this is the, uh, uh, the Pelton turbine. And actually, um, yeah, this is the standard pelter turbine. Actually, the water wheel you see at the, the old water wheels, you also have the kind of pelter turbine. But also there, the head is converted into velocity and the velocity drops onto the water wheel and make the water wheel turning around. There's also kind of very simplified shape of the, of the pelter turbine. So like I said, the pelter turbine is a pulse turbine. So you get a tangential flow in this direction. Uh, for normally you need high, high differences, small phlegmatic flow. Uh, and the, the basic fonts, you don't have cavitation, but okay, because you have the high, high difference, you don't have cavitation. That's the, the thing, because you don't get any pressure conversion into the uh, into the rotor anymore. It's only impulse conversion into the rotor. So normally, yeah, there's the injector, the inflow. You can normally change the, the area and the deflector to get the right flow into the pelter wheel. And this is really how such a pelter wheel uh, would look like normally closer. Look like, and you can change the, the, the flow by changing this, this, this nozzle here. Okay, something about uh, the Pelton turbine. And really, what you see here is actually uh, you have the, the velocity out of the, the, the jet. Uh, the U1 is actually uh, the velocity from the, uh, the buckets are rotating. And uh, V1 is the relative velocity versus of the, the, the jet versus the bucket. So that is V1 minus U1. So it comes here, V1 enters here. And normally you have an exit velocity. It, for, it cannot fully turn around with normal exit velocity because we have to get rid of the water. 
this is how it is converted. And because of this conversion of this uh, velocity, uh, you gain the power. You, you convert the, 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 the inlet velocity into power. Okay, now we're going to do uh, an example for a hydraulic turbine. It's also in place where I think we can work it through now. So I can see if I can get my iPad running again. So we're now going to do this thing. So we need a four megawatt, four megawatt uh, turbine. Um, 400 RPM, so watts per minute, 200 meter reservoir, and we got 90% hydraulic losses. So actually out of the 200 meter, we only leave out about 180 meter available for the pump. So we have the potential to a 1.5 diameter circle. So the diameter is 1.5 meter of the router. Yeah. Okay. 10% velocity decrease, and we get uh, uh, 165 bucket. Okay. I will share again. To, uh, to my iPi, iPad, so wait a minute to get it working. iPad, sure. Okay. So we got the 400 megawatts turbine running at uh, um, 400 RPM. And we got 200 meter uh, reservoir, 90% hydraulic. So first of all, what we will do if we have the 200 meter reservoir, that goes to the jet. So what is, if we get here the jet, we got here the Pelton wheel with a diameter of 1.5 meter. 1.5 meter. So the first one is phi u. You, sorry, you the velocity here. So what is V? Well, we know the difference is um, so. So we can calculate V square divided by G is uh, delta Z divided by two G of course. V square divided by two G is delta Z is the high difference. So if we wouldn't have any losses, it would be the two hundred meter, but we assume. 10% uh, of losses, so 90% efficiency. So the V square divided by 2G is 90% of 200 is 180. So you can calculate that V is uh, 0.4 meter per second. You can calculate that out. So this is V. So this V is. 59.4 meter per second. We can of course also calculate U is omega air. Well, we have 400 RPM is 400 divided by, by R is 400 divided by 60 seconds divided times 2 P times 0.75 because we have to convert that. So 400 RPM is 400 rounds per minute divided by 60 seconds cubed times 2p to get an angular velocity out of it and uh, times the, uh, um, uh, the, the the radius of the of the, the wheel and we end up here with a velocity of 25 8 meter per second so that is u so that's the bucket velocity so the buckets rotate pass by at this velocity Well, then we can see here, so if you look at such a bucket, we get V coming on here. The bucket is going with this V, this U. So the relative velocity, so the, 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 the velocity, the bucket C, 
re relative is phi jet minus u um, is so phi jet is is 59.4 minus 28 is 31.4 meter per second. So if you really look at the bucket here, you get here W is 31.4 meter per second. So if you go to this bucket, 31.4, and we see it goes out like this. Then we had, I think, the angular thing from 165. So uh, then we should like this one. So this angle is, um, so this beta two, so this is beta two is 180 minus 165 degrees is 50 degrees. So this is 15 degrees, sorry, 15. In degrees. So we got here, you did this W in, did this W out. Well, we also said that W out um, I have to check it again. Okay, got so. so W out, we also said in the beginning it was stated that. Um, the relative velocity decreases by 10% as the water travels to the bucket. So W out, W out is 90% of W in. Okay. So the W out is 0.9 times 31.4. I have to calculate that. Okay, that's something like uh, 27, 28. Okay, quickly calculate that calculation. Um, and then you have this direction like this. And actually, it's if you look like uh, the momentum balance, the only part that's relevant for W out for the momentum balance is, of course, the W out theta. So we know this one, this is beta again. So we're really only interested, interested in this part because that's the really relevant W out for the, the momentum balance. So W out theta is um, cosinus beta times uh, W out is cosinus beta times um, 0.9 times 31.4. And uh, if you calculate that back, you come to, and this is 15, you come to W out 2, W out theta, W out theta is 24. 0.35 meter per second. So if we go again, again to the bucket, we have here 31.4, and we go like this, and we have 24.4 out. And this one is, uh, you can also calculate the x direction. Uh, that's with, with the sinus, of course, with W out times the sinus. So if we calculate, so um, uh, phi, so we know phi theta two, because the bucket are still rotating there with the velocity u, phi theta out, or phi theta two, is the bucket velocity minus w out theta, is of course again the bucket velocity we had it on top here, uh, 28 meter per second. Uh, your bucket is the rest of bucket velocity. Wait a minute, I'm missing. Uh, 
the bucket is 31.4, sorry, 31.4 minus v, uh, uh, minus 24.4 is about seven meter per second. So we have V theta in is V in, we know that. And we have V theta out is seven meter per second. And we can have the feet that for in if this one is five meter. So this is really if you like there, and then you can calculate uh, the head, of course. Then we have that head calculation again. So the head calculation for such a turbine is again u times v theta one minus v, sorry, minus, um, I calculate like that, is again the order equation again, v theta in minus v theta out divided by g. Well, we have the bucket velocity is 31.4, the so u burn, v theta one is 59, minus seven divided by G. So this is the, this is the head that's generated by the turbine. Head generated by the turbine. turbine. Then we have, of course, what's available. So if you really see what's available at the head, that's again the kinetic energy because that's converted in the nozzle. So the available input energy, input head is uh, V squared, V1 squared divided by G, 2G again, sorry. So really about half the velocity, 2G. And then you can calculate. So if you have the, the efficiency is the, the, the generated head, divided by a fadeable head. And then you come to this number is, um, you can calculate it out is 93%. And actually these are typical numbers for, for, for such a, uh, a wheel. So that's quite, it's, it's a quite a good number for such a, for, for belt will be about something like 90%. Now we can also the cal calculate flow. So um, you can calculate uh, the Q. So the power is generated. You can calculate delta P divided by Q. So that's really the definition of, of how you can calculate that the power is, um, is Q times, uh, Delta H times rho. Now we know it's four megawatt. We know that it's four megawatt. We know uh, Delta H and we know rho. So in this case, we can calculate if you work that out further because that we can have to calculate at here. Put it in there. We we'll put in for the co thousand meters per second. We know this four megawatt. If we put it all together, we can get here that the Q is well. What kind of units you do? I just copied it from a worked out example. You see this also on the slides. It's nine point four cubic meter per second. So you can cal we'll calculate in this way with the four megawatt. You know the delta H from the turbine, the rho, they'll work it out. And then we can have the specific speed. Well, we have that equation again, um, is the specific speed we have here times power till the power half tells the head till the by fourth. Well, if we work it out for this turbine, so we have that the specific speed is uh, 400 RPM times uh, uh, square root of four divided by uh, 200 to the power by fourth is 32.6. And then we can bow back to in the system. Oh, sorry. 
And then we see we're in the wide range for such a system here. So normally uh, the Pelta is somewhere between uh, six and 60, the range for the six to 60. So you're in the wide range for a Pelton turbine. Range Pelton. So these are the, 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 uh, the, 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 yeah, the kind of calculation you can do with the turbine. And this kind of calculation you can uh, also expect on, on the exam either a pump in the system or a turbine in the system. So please get familiar with you. Uh, next week, Tuesday, we will discuss uh, a, a pump in the system. We do calculation on the pump in the system and we do discuss the compressor curve and pump curves. This video about the turbine. Okay, I will share my screen again. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will, if you look like this calculation, this example also completely worked out on the slides. And we will both put them on Barge page and on the Google Drive for the external students. Um, but it's actually the same number we got here. So you get a fully worked out example to can practice yourself with it. Okay, this is the class for today. I don't know if there are any questions. You can ask them verbally or by um, or by chat. I don't see anything coming in. No. Well, if there are no any questions, um, the next class is coming Tuesday. And next class, we will discuss again pump curves, and we will discuss an application of a pump system and also discuss uh, MPSH uh, and things like that. And the second half of the class, we will discuss uh, compressor curves and, and my name is compressor curve, many compressor curves and why is the shape of a compressor curve like that? Search and stall will be discussed in the second part of the class. I see a question, will the exam be uh, open book exam or proctored? Um, it will, yeah, because we have to also do work this year for the first with online exam. So the normal when we had the uh, the uh, original, you had the formula sheet with the main formulas on it. Um, we will probably, but we have to work out that the coming weeks is probably we will have a, a time slot per question and you have to solve that question in that time slot and you go to the next question. So we have to work out that uh, before the exam. But uh, yeah, you probably can use your book uh, uh, because yeah, we're all online. Uh, but we'll have, we'll have a calculation to be done yourself. So it will be, yeah, it, it, it won't be proctored. No, partly proctored. Mm -hmm. Are there more questions? Well, I don't see any questions coming in. Okay, then I'll leave it like this for today. I wish you a good weekend and hope to see you all next Tuesday when we will discuss further about uh, pump curves and compressor curves. Uh, so I wish you all the best and uh, well, see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sikha. Bye.